Open Intellectual and Boundaries Commission said Monday that candidate William Ruto won 50.49% of the vote just ahead. participated in our campaigns. Peace. Peacefully. The millions who turned up to vote for us. The vice chair of the Electoral Commission said she and the other three commissioners disowned the official results. Because of the opaque nature of how this face has been handled, we therefore cannot take ownership on the results that is going to be announced. However, we have an open door that people can go to court. And because of the same, we urge Kenyans to be peaceful because the rule of the law is going to prevail. To some, the split in the commission cast doubt on the legality of Ruta's victory. Donald Rabala, a Nairobi lawyer, who supports Odinga, said any results declared by the election chief are null and void unless he's backed by at least four of the seven members of the electoral commission. However, other lawyers say the chairman, Wafula Chebukati, has the authority to declare a winner on his own. The swearing-in of Kenya's new president is scheduled to take place in two weeks, but any legal challenge could delay the inauguration. Mohamed Yusuf for VA News, Nairobi. In Kenya, supporters of Deputy President William Ruto of the Kenya Kwanzaa Alliance have been rejoicing after he was declared winner of the country's August 9th presidential election. Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission Chair Wafula Chibukati said Ruto won 50.49% of the vote, while Raila Odinga received 48.85%. Abdul Shakur Aboud of VOA Swahili Service is in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. He tells me that Odinga has yet to comment on the results. It has been celebration all night in the areas where Ruto has a stronghold, especially in the Rift Valley and uh, central area of uh, Kenya. We have seen a lot of celebrations taking place all night long. People are very happy. Those of his followers have been celebrating, but it has been totally subdued in the areas where is the stronghold of Raila Odinga. Has there been any reaction from Raila Odinga himself? No, Raila Odinga up to now has made no official comment and we have not heard from any official person from Azimio Movement or Azimio Alliance of Raila Odinga. So everybody is waiting. There's been a lot of messages on uh, Twitter and social media asking for him to come. Just accept that he does not agree or he agrees about the results. What do you think? Is he likely to challenge the results? Up to this moment, he has not come out clearly to say if he is going to challenge it or not. Even any members of his alliance have said nothing. We have not seen anybody. The last time we heard was the Secretary General of the Alliance saying that the results cannot be validated and we are not sure what that means and what they're going to do. But up to now, nothing or no indication he is going to file a lawsuit. We learned, Shakur, that there's been a split in the uh, IEBC, the Independent Electoral Commission. What can you tell us? Yes, uh, there is a split. Four members of the Electoral Commission, led by the vice chairman, said that they will not accept and they are not part of the results which have been announced. We have no idea why, because they called for a press conference at the Serena Hotel. They just made that sentence and said elections went on well, but we don't agree with the results. But they did not give any specific explanation why they don't agree with that. But they said they will issue a 
detailed statement later. So we are not sure what they are for. That's four members out of the seven. So we have to wait and see probably today there might be a statement from either side, if it's Raila Odinga or the commissions. And the vice chairman of the commission is known as a sympathizer of the alliance, Azimio Alliance. This was the fifth or fourth times that Raila Odinga has run for president? Yes, it's the fifth uh, time that he's run for president and has not been able to win. Shakur, thank you so much again. We look forward to speaking with you again on Wednesday. Thank you very much. That was Abdul Shakur Aboud of the US Swahili Service on assignment in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. South Africa's Defense Minister Tandy Modise has arrived in Russia for a Moscow-hosted conference on international security. The visit comes amid Russia's ongoing invasion of Ukraine and as Russian forces there are occupying Europe's largest nuclear power plant. It also comes just days after U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited South Africa in part to try to win more African support against Russia's invasion. Vicky Stark has more from Cape Town, South Africa. Despite South Africa repeatedly proclaiming its neutrality in the Russia-Ukraine war, several analysts say Minister Modise's attendance at the 10th Moscow Conference on International Security shows the country is siding with Russia. Ralph Mateka is a political analyst at Geopolitical Intelligence Services. We have not seen any condemnation of Russia despite the dire impact of the war on the supply of goods and services in South Africa. And also when you look at uh, attending a, a defense kind of a forum in a moment such as this, I mean, I cannot imagine any stronger indication of support of uh, Russia. Mateka believes it's a blow to South Africa-US relations, considering US Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited South Africa just last week. It actually says that South Africa is nailing its colors to the mask. I think it was a frustrating visit for the Secretary of State because South Africa did not hold back on their indication that they are not going to pick sides on this. They are not going to be bullied by global powers in their continued Cold War. Mateka warns that while South Africa may be willing to rely on its bigger partners in the BRICS alliance, namely China and India, to help it through these turbulent economic times, it should not ignore the reality that the European Union and America are two of its biggest trading partners. Sipo Mantula, a researcher at the Thabo Mbeki African School on Public and International Affairs, says it's likely South Africa couldn't ignore the invitation because of its status as a member of the African Union's Peace and Security Council. He says Russia also has a close relationship with many African states whose freedom fighters it helped train during the 1960s and 70s. The conflict of Russia and Ukraine is absent from this official program. The key issues that will come out can be around uh, dealing with international global terrorism, the issues of Middle East and North Africa. However, he conceded that while South Africa may call for peaceful negotiations to end the Russian-Ukraine war, the gathering in Moscow may be a sign of a potential military alliance. One, one will assume so because Russia is trying by all means to galvanize its support politically uh, economically, militarily. So one will assume that they are trying by all means because this is a very high level technical meeting uh, that is taking place. And one will assume, yes, it is part of mobilizing uh, allies, mobilizing uh, those who can say they are friendly towards Russia. Defense Minister Modi says due to address the Moscow Security Conference Tuesday. Vicky Stark for VOA News, Cape Town, South Africa. Africa on the Voice of America. I'm James Butte in Washington. Today is Tuesday, August 16th. Benin's former president, Yayi Boni, is due to arrive in the Guinean capital, Kunakri, today. He is scheduled to meet members of the military junta, the opposition coalition, the National Front for Defense of the Constitution, organizers of a recent protest, civil society, and other stakeholders. Officials say Boni's trip is part of mediation efforts to ease political tensions by ECOWAS, the economic community of West African states. This after at least five people were killed in a recent protest. Demonstrators demanded that junta leader Colonel Mamadi Dumbuya step down. 
for expectations about the anticipated mediation efforts by ECOWAS, VOS Peter Clotter reached Attorney Theano Balde. He is the president of the NGO called the Board of Research and of the Institute on Democracy and Rule of Law. Uh, as you might know, the military want to stay in power for three years. And uh, the civil society group and the opposition political parties want uh, them to stay in power for two years. So there is a need uh, to dialogue, to talk and uh, find a common ground for the interest of the Guinea. But so far, it has been difficult uh, to sit around the table between the CNRD and uh, the civil society group and political parties. So the main objective of the former Beninese president is to try to find a common ground and uh, put all the parties together, negotiate, and find uh, a consensual agreement. Does his arrival and anticipated meetings with all these groups part of ECOWAS's effort to calm down or ease tensions in Guinea following the recent protests that led to at least five people being killed? The ECOWAS is trying now to bring together all the parties that are involved in the transition to negotiate and uh, find a common ground. But so far it has been very difficult because the junta is not up to any real and uh, uh, consensual negotiations. It's why the ECOWAS came a few weeks ago, they met uh, the junta. It seemed that uh, they had an agreement, but uh, it turned out not the case. Since uh, the civil society groups, the political parties, want to organize another manifestation in the coming uh, uh, days, and every time there is a demonstration, there, there are always uh, civilians who are killed. And the ECOWAS uh, want to uh, avoid to have the same loss of life like the previous demonstration. Fiano, what are the expectations of the people of Guinea in anticipation of the former Beninese president's arrival? Uh, I'm sure most of the Guineans, they expect to have a peaceful transition that will lead to free and fair elections. It's a what the most important uh, part of the country want. To. The junta is arguing that uh, they have to clean up the political uh, environment, uh, try to set up new institutions, and that it will take uh, time before it's done, before they organize also any elections. I think the most important issue right now is the fight against uh, corruption, the recuperation of the properties that belong to the state. And all of those issues can be discussed, agreed around the table because it's in the interest of all Guineans. The only issue is for each of the parties to believe or to think that it's possible. Tiano Baldi is the president of the NGO called Board of Research and the Institute on Democracy and Rule of Law in Guinea. You are speaking from Conakry with VOS Peter Clotty. Liberian President George Weir is being called upon to immediately fire three senior officials of his government after they were sanctioned by the U.S. government for their involvement in numerous counts of alleged public corruption. The three officials are Minister of State for Presidential Affairs Nathaniel McGee, Sema Serenius Cephas, Solicitor General and Chief Prosecutor, and Bill Twawe. Managing Director of the National Port Authority. In a statement on Monday, the U.S. Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control said that, quote, through their corruption, the three officials have undermined democracy in Liberia for their own personal benefit. McGill did not respond to our request for comment. CFOS said he needs to review the report, its sources, and those involved in smearing his character before responding. Councillor Tiawan Gonglo is a prospective presidential candidate in Liberia's 2023 presidential elections. He tells me that the three officials should be dismissed for disgracing their offices. Everywhere many Liberians applaud the action taken by the United States government 
More than 300,000 people have died in this country as a result of civil conflict caused by bad governance. It just doesn't make sense that people will be in government and engage in corruption in a reckless manner as they are doing now. Therefore, we applaud the action taken by the United States government. It is very important and it will serve as a deterrence to those other will-be corrupt officials of government, the three branches of government. Of course, uh, Mr. McGee and uh, Councillor Serena Seifos, they play a very important role in the government. Is it possible? What, what... It is shameful, James, that for the first time in the history of Liberia, a solicitor general is being sanctioned and the chief of staff of the president is being sanctioned. They did not bring dignity to that office. It's disgraceful and uh, is embarrassing. All well-meaning Liberia people could not be so reckless in the performance of their duties. What do you suppose should be the consequence? President George Weah, in order to extricate himself and at least show to the Liberian people that he's so different from them, should dismiss them immediately. You saying that President George Weah should dismiss them? He should dismiss them immediately. The country is higher than any individual. Nobody is indispensable to this country. They should be dismissed. President Weah may argue, perhaps, he needs to give these three officials the chance to defend themselves. Okay. This is the international arena. When you act defiantly to a country like the United States, you should be prepared to bear the consequences. And I know the consequences will affect every average Liberian. And this could cause mass disenchantment. We have seen people rising up in countries like Sudan and other areas causing the government to come down. No government in this world is capable of withstanding mass action by the people of any country, no matter what army you have. So you should be smart enough to take some actions that will help calm the storm because if sanctions are imposed on Liberia and, for example, essential commodities are not coming or different types of sanctions are imposed and we can't get the kind of aid we want to have, we will be in trouble. What if the United States, that is the biggest shareholder in the World Bank, decides that it is sanctioning Liberia and stopping World Bank activities in Liberia? You know the consequences that will be on us? So, for a few people, this country should not suffer. We've been through already. Over 300,000 people die in this country. Nobody is indispensable to this country. Not me, not President. We are not anybody. Therefore, to the extent that the conduct of those people in government has caused our government to be so embarrassed, he should get rid of them, dismiss them from government, at least as the, the minimum thing to do, to show that he is not in collusion with them. If he doesn't do so, then he's part of the conspiracy to bring Liberia down. Councillor Gonglo, it's always nice to talk with you. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, yeah, my pleasure. Councillor Tiawang Gonglo is an aspiring candidate to Liberia's 23 presidential election. He was speaking from the Liberian capital, Monrovia. Earlier, the U.S. Ambassador to Liberia, Michael McCarthy, highlighted the impact of corruption on Liberia's development efforts 19 years since the end of the country's civil war. When a newborn child fails to achieve standard growth benchmarks, doctors call that failure to thrive. It means there's something wrong. In the United States, the legislative branch and the executive branch are in 100% agreement on policy regarding Liberia. They're both calling for action on the primary cause of Liberia's failure to thrive, a long-term infestation of rampant and pervasive corruption. Corruption steals from the poorest. It blunts or negates the impact of all of our development projects It defeats initiatives before they can even be launched. And it raises risk and uncertainty to a level that drives away foreign investment. U.S. Ambassador to Liberia, Michael McCarthy, speaking Monday in Monrovia. A female journalist was arrested in South Sudan's capital on August 7th while covering a protest over high food prices has been released from detention. Sheila Pawney reports from the South Sudanese capital of Juba. Ding Magot, a freelance correspondent for the Voice of America, was arrested at Konyokonyo Market along with six protesters for working without an identification document. Last week, the U.S. Embassy in Juba demanded that Magut be released immediately and stated that journalists have the right to do their work without interference or harm. 
According to Magot's lawyer, Stephen Wane, Magot was released Monday on bail, pending further investigations into her case. The bail does not mean that this case has been dismissed. It just means that uh, uh, they have been released on bail. And uh, uh, once the investigation is done, or once the, the investigator and the CPA, the government, sees that they have conducted uh, the investigation and they're done with it, the file will be transferred to court. Uh, so so uh, this is to say that, uh, yes, the case is still ongoing. And uh, all the accused, including Ding, uh, may be summoned uh, before court uh, if the matter has been transferred to court. The release of the journalist brought much relief to her family. Ding Magot's sister, Ayuen, explains what the family has been doing to secure her release. Ever since her arrest... As a family, we've been trying to knock on doors, even doors of government officials, so that they are able to give an ear to her case and speedily remove her from detention. South Sudan is ranked 139th out of 180 countries on the World Press Freedom Index. The index says journalists in South Sudan have faced harassment, arbitrary detention, torture, and even death in incidences where they did not practice self-censorship. I went discuss the repercussions of journalists' arrests in South Sudan, which she believes will dissuade young people from pursuing careers as journalists. Because this is a profession, a noble profession, and there are young people out there who have dreams to become journalists. What happens to them in such situations? They are looking, they are watching, they will be told, no, don't enter this profession because it's risky. Oyed Patrick Charles, president of the Union of Journalists of South Sudan, confirmed the release of Ding Magot. He noted that she was detained beyond the hours permitted by the constitution on the grounds that the state attorney requested for more time to consider her case. Sheila Oponi for VOA News. Juba, South Sudan. And that's it for this Tuesday, August 16th edition of Daybreak Africa. We thank you for joining us this morning. For more African news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are also on YouTube, where you can watch our TV shows, Africa 54, Straight Talk Africa, and Red Carpet. On behalf of the Daybreak Africa crew, I'm James Barty in Washington.